All right, thank you so much for the wonderful welcome and introduction, Melissa. That was wonderful. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Awesome. Uh, so yeah, I am Megan Gray. Um, I currently live in East Texas, deep East Texas, uh, so closer to Louisiana than I am to Dallas currently. Uh, but I have two dogs, three cats, and 11 chickens. And a little over two years ago, at this point, I was wiping down counters at Denny's. And now I'm ramping up the test automation with a major fintech company based out of Plantation, Florida called Trade Station. Um, and I would love to share with you some of the, the skills that I've developed over the past couple of years to get me where I am today. And also um, some of the skills that I've used to help others. So, yes. Um, all right, so some of the objectives that we're gonna be going through today are some of the main issues and pain points that come up whenever it comes to looking for a new opportunity um, that mainly come down to research, having a general lack of support and guidance, um, having issues tracking your own personal achievements and goals, um, networking as a whole, and the pain point that everyone experiences at some point is being underpaid and not receiving fair compensation. So the strategies all along the right are what we are going to be going over today. First of which, we are gonna be going over research, which is probably a love-hate relationship for a lot of people. Um, one of the biggest obstacles with looking for a new opportunity is knowing where to start, um, especially whenever you're um, going into a new industry or you're a new college grad or a boot camp grad, you have all of this accrued knowledge, all of the technical know-how, but not having any connections um, or really what the role ideally looks like day to day and what the requirements look like. Um, so having the dedicated time for researching key responsibilities of the role via LinkedIn or Glassdoor are definitely going to be your main bread and butter. Um, I'm pretty sure most of you have already run into this at, the, at some point, but having the blocked off time in your schedule, about 30 to 45 minutes a day, you do not need to do more than that. Um, but that is definitely a good start. The one of the other um, one of the other times that you know that you need a change or a challenge is when you're currently when you currently have a position and you like the the company that you're currently in, but you you want to branch out into another role or you want different responsibilities, or if you feel like you have too many responsibilities, getting a better idea for the role that you want and comparing it against what you already have. Um, that's where research definitely comes into play. Your biggest, um, your one main job at this point is to create a fully fleshed out profile of what that role is. Uh, a lot of certificate courses on uh, Udemy, Coursera, Google certificates, they have the job description or the job title in those courses. So you can get an inside look without even having to commit to you know additional learning um, and then also interviews for research purposes now this one of course you know well megan i'm already having trouble getting interviews in the first place but it, once you get to the point of interviewing consistently not only does it keep the interview skills fresh but if you're part of a network then you can kind of lay out the profile for your peers and other people looking for positions as well um, and getting information on their current tech stack, what languages they're learning, um, and again, building that profile. Um, do you have any questions so far? <laughs> I know I just threw a lot of information at you. Mm -hmm. 
Megan, curious if you or anyone in the audience wants to chime in, have um, a, an example of when you've reached out to someone that has your ideal job and what that conversation looks like or how you, how you went about finding people that had your ideal job. So one of the things, at least in my situation, because again, I'm more along the QA side of development. Um, one of the things that I realized is that the title does not always meet, meet the requirements or the roles and resp responsibilities. A lot of different companies use the same one size fits all title for um, a lot of different responsibilities. And that's one of the ways that they get you <laughs> um, in terms of you know, your salary and negotiating for benefits. But I think it was extremely necessary to reach out for um, to get a better idea of what I didn't want, because I thought in my head that I wanted to be just solely an automation engineer, but there are so many other aspects of QA that I knew that I was passionate about, but I didn't know what I didn't know. So like, again, having those conversations with people made me realize, oh, wait, that, that's more of an independent contributor role. Well, I want to work on a team in conjunction with a whole bunch of other people because that is what suits my skill sets. Maybe I don't want that. Um, so that's just something I ran into. Yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned the issue of job titles being different at different places and um, having conversations with people to illuminate those different titles because then that helps with your, your research. You have additional keywords to look up. For sure. Um, and yeah, that's something that you can bring into negotiations as well. So we'll keep that in mind for later. Um, does anyone have any other questions? If not, we can move on. Okay. And looks like we can get rolling. Okay, guidance and support. This is actually one of my favorite topics. So one of the things that um, whenever you think of support and guidance, you think of mentorship, you think of having you know your manager and you can definitely feel the absence of that support and guidance you know, whenever it's not there. Whether it's you don't have a manager period where you are you know, currently looking for a position um, or your manager's key responsibilities don't seem like they include helping you with goal setting and goal tracking um, or you know, some other combination or scenario. Um, one of the things that's definitely going to help with advancing your career is tracking, and we're gonna to get to that in the next slide, but the whole takes a village anecdote definitely matters here. So whether that means relying on your, your manager or mentor, um, that having that for external processing is gonna be extremely helpful. So, external processing. Um, is anyone familiar with the term? No? Yes? Okay. So external processing is one of my favorite terms. <laughs> um, it basically, it's uh, having someone that can keep you accountable and help you air your thoughts out. And even if like, you know that you know these things, or you know how to um, Say, say we're writing code, say or you know how to write a Python script to launch an app, but you just need someone to be there to help pressure you to do the thing in a good amount of pressure, in a, a good amount of accountability. And that's something that I'm talking about here in terms of mentorship. So having consistent check-ins um, to ensure your progress is going in the right way, that you have everything that you need. And also to remind you that you are doing a good job because we need validation. And 
that is definitely going to help, especially because, you know, job seeking or job advancement is very, very rarely a straight line. It and sometimes takes a really long time, especially if you want to make sure that you are getting the best fit possible. So, um, and then we're going to talk about, okay, so you don't have a manager, you don't have a mentor, how do I find that? <laughs> um, so initiating online relationships, that can stem from so many places, um, and we'll get to networking. <laughs> um, but what you're gonna wanna do first is evaluate your current support system. Because um, I don't know about you, but me personally, I, whenever people are not necessarily like near me, they unfortunately become out of sight, out of mind. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that, you know, you're surrounded by the things that you prioritize. And with us being exclusively work from home, um, you're surrounded by your friends, your family, your loved ones. So that doesn't necessarily always mean your cohorts. Um, so writing down a list of all the people that you find beneficial or uplifting or supportive um, in a semi-professional or professional sense. It could mean, you know, college friends or, or colleagues that you, you've worked with in some capacity, or you just remember that they had a positive influence on your life. Um, and writing down all of those people and essentially seeing if they spark joy to see if you want to reach back out to them and say, hey, I'm working on this or I'm looking to find a job. Do you mind if I just bounce ideas off you every you know, week or so? Um, and odds are, if they're friends, <laughs> then they're not gonna say no, even if it's just as a sounding board. Um, but, and that's also a good way to determine the type of support that you need. I have a link at the end of this presentation where it helps you go through that checklist of every single type of um, support. So emotional, technical, uh, career navigation, et cetera, um, so that you can better find, fill out the profile of that individual that you're looking for. Like I probably will not go to my mom for technical support. I probably will not um, ask my next door neighbor for career navigation since she's 80. Um, just, and she worked in healthcare. So just making sure that you're going to the right people for the right things. Leveraging your network. So mentorship can come from networks and we are extremely beneficial that we are in an event right now that is put on by a wonderful network called Women Who Code. And there are many wonderful organizations that uh, provide the same support. We're pretty awesome. But um, the amount of support that come from these tech organizations is pretty immense. And so long as you're able to um, go in there and be consistent, show your face or your presence, consistently and add value to those to that network, whether it be through conversations or hosting programs or uh, posting job applications, stuff like that. Uh, odds are you are going to benefit from it as well. Um, and I think I'm good for this right now. Emily, do you have any questions? Yeah, just a, a question for the audience. Does anyone have an example of a mentor that has helped them within their career? Like what that looks like, what type of support they were looking for and what they provided? Um, I didn't necessarily have a mentor, but this whole slide kind of really spoke to me because when I was looking for my first job when I was trying to switch careers into tech, um, I really struggled to have that accountability that you're talking about. And so um, I did uh, go to a lot of meetups and try to find people who were in a similar situation to me. And I ended up um, actually kind of starting my own accountability group 
because I found that so many of us were sort of looking for that same kind of outer accountability, but we just didn't really ha have a way. It just was very, you know, disorganized. So um, we actually started a group and met every week for a few weeks and uh, it works really well. Actually, most of us ended up um, getting the jobs we were looking for and meeting our goals. So it's definitely something that I would recommend to somebody, even if it's not a whole group, just finding a partner, uh, somebody you can, you know, check in with and make sure you're advancing towards your goals. I, I felt it was really helpful for me. So yeah, I would recommend that. That's awesome. That's it. That is so cool. That makes me happy. Does anyone else have any other questions or anecdotes? I, I love hearing success success stories and like those little additions there. So anytime. Cool. I have something. Yeah. Hello everyone. I'm Christina. Um, so I, I recently, like Hannah was mentioning, went through a career change trying to get into tech. Uh, this is my first full, well, almost full year of being in tech. So it's very exciting. Um, but I came, I did a boot camp. And um, one of my, I was lucky that pretty much everyone in my cohort was in the same position as I was. And I did have someone who kind of formed that accountability thing. But for something that, that helped me um, is I <laughs> just made a big giant spreadsheet and I just kept track of like every job I applied to, like what the process was, who my contact was, what the salary range was like and it, it, even my I was lucky that my my um uh process wasn't very long in finding a, a position I was very fortunate um but it was very affirming to myself to have to kind of see my progress even whether or not because like sometimes you never hear back but like seeing the amount that you've <laughs> the effort that you've put in um, was really helpful. Um, my sister actually was kind of doing the same thing. It was like a shared spreadsheet. She had a list of whatever she was trying to do. I don't even remember at the time. And I had mine. And even though we weren't even on the same like realm, it was, it kind of, she saw what I was doing and it kind of like, oh man, I should get on my stuff too. Um, but really it was, it really was just for me. Um, Cause at the end of the day, you have to want it, I guess, um, have some sorts of, of drive. And it just kind of, it helped me to have a visual representation of, of my effort and my progress. So that, that was helpful to me. Yeah, for sure. It's so much of the job search effort is not visible. You know, it can only be felt in like perceived effort, <laughs> which makes it super difficult. And, you know, a lot of people relate, you know, with, you know, oh, I, I feel like I just uh, submitted like six applications today. And, you know, that's also a great idea in terms of recognizing your burnout. And if you're going to be close to burnout because of your like levels of productivity or, you know, how much time or effort that you're putting in each day. So that's a really good idea. <laughs> you should make a template for that and sell it. <laughs> That's a really good idea. I, I wouldn't mind sharing it either um, with the group um, just to see what I did. Most of the links I got from was from like the like main women who code uh, job search board, which is very helpful, by the way. That is they're very responsive. Uh, so, yeah, that's kind of how I found this branch. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. I was just going to share something really quick. Hi, uh, my name is Amy. I um, just recently went through a major acquisition with a small company that I was working for, and now I'm at a huge company. Um, and all of us that were acquired, um, there were a lot of communications that were going on, you know, through that initial setup. We're still within the first year of it. It just happened back in uh, April. And so there's a lot of communications going back and forth um, and things that were easily missed by a lot of people. One of the things that I caught on to was that this new company has a um, mentorship program and um, they put it on for like, I think 
I think it ended up being about four months worth. And um, out of everybody that was in my group that was acquired, I was the only one that saw that. Um, and I wish I would have mentioned it like out loud to everyone else. I just assumed that everybody else saw it, but it was something that was kind of easily missed. And so, you know, just kind of keeping with the uh, um, checking what contacts you have and, and um, who you can check in with, maybe keep an eye out for those sort of options, because that was something that I was not anticipating having access to. Once I realized that it was there, um, my mentor has been amazing through this whole transition. <laughs> um, probably couldn't have done it without her and uh, super grateful for that opportunity. So just something maybe to keep an eye out for if that's something that your company possibly offers because easily missed by everybody else in my group. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, structured accountability and structured internships and type situations where it comes to mentoring like that are super exclusive. And if they do come around, definitely apply if you have the uh, time and allotment for it. So that's a really great addition. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move on over to leveraging online relationships. So this is more along the lines of I don't have a mentor how can I get one? <laughs> um, because starting from square one, if we don't have you know, the structured mentorship programs or someone readily available to us, um, it can be pretty daunting. So I currently have a mentor and she's absolutely amazing. Her name is Donnell Baker. And I met her through my best friend, Pete, um, who in a lot of ways is also my mentor but not everyone has the privilege of having well-connected friends that just happen to do what you want to do. Um, so one of the things that I found in my search um, was through LinkedIn, they have those uh, essentially tags for each profile that make it a little bit easier to search for people who want to talk about a particular topic. So for some, I'm sure you've seen it, um, on their profile, it says, reach out to me about blank. And it'll either say nonprofit or, you know, software testing or something like that. And a very commonly used one right now is mentoring and guidance. So it might take a little bit of filtering in terms of, um, you know, who you want to be your mentor. So like figuring out um, whether it be the job title, that you ideally, ideally would like to learn from. So uh, Danelle, you know, she's chief of staff. She has a lot of experience in software testing at different companies. And that was extremely valuable knowledge to me for my particular path. So of course I wanted to talk to her about that, but um, yeah. And you also have access to their profile, which is essentially their resume on LinkedIn. So being able to see like, okay, well, they spent like six years at X company in this company. So yeah, I would love to learn about that. Um, and you have instant conversation starters there, but um, obviously reaching out is super hard. And especially when you're doing it in mass, it can make you feel either kind of like a salesperson, which if you're on the more technical side of things that might not come naturally, um, but keeping it casual, but not Facebook casual <laughs> um, is probably your best bet with getting people to respond. So honing in on something that you can see based off of their profile or you know, based off of some research that you might have in common. Like if you see someone went to a Yankees game a couple of years ago, be like, oh my gosh, I love the Yankees, um, you know, start off, with that and then just say hey i have a couple of questions that i want to run by you as, as it pertains to x you know xyz whatever you'd like to talk about but keep those questions vague so that they can actually respond to you and that not be the end of the total conversation um and then just after those vaguer type questions just say do you have 15 20 minutes to hop on a zoom call and most of the time they're gonna say yes. But uh, I also have a template 
in the links that you can follow if you need a little bit more help scripted script wise. Uh, also, so going back to the Udemy courses, Google courses, stuff like that. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in the past couple of years is that the course creators, they typically have discords or, you know, other messaging Slack groups where they have their students or, um, you know, people that purchase and follow their courses where they can bounce ideas off each other and ask questions to the teacher. So they remain relatively active. So you can either use that discord to its advantage and continue to harbor it and build relationships there. Or you can always reach out to the creator themselves and be like, hey, I have these questions. And even if they don't have the uh, availability for mentorship, odds are they're going to have experience. Otherwise, they wouldn't have made a Udemy course or a Coursera course, and they'll be a little bit more plugged in to give you recommendations on who you should reach out to. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Again, I just want to bring in some participation, see if anyone has had success with this. I know in my personal experience, COVID's made me a little bit more brave in developing these online relationships. It feels more natural and our networks have grown as a result because we're not confined to our uh, geographical area. Um, does anyone else have a similar experience or have um, leveraged an online relationship like this in the past? No takers on this one? That's okay. okay. Well, um, there will be a kind of final Q&A at the very end. If anything pops up, feel free to ask at that point. All right, personal tracking. This is my love-hate relationship. This is my personal choice for the love-hate relationship <laughs> because it is something that I've personally struggled with um, in the past, but mostly because in previous positions, I've had to use QuickBooks for time tracking. And if anyone has any experience with that, it's rough. Um, but it is also one of the most beneficial whenever it comes to, um, like, you know that you're unhappy in a position. Okay, why? Is it because your day-to-day -day is hectic? Yes, why? <laughs> um, is it because the job requirements continue to shift? how are they shifting like what responsibilities are you being assigned that make you feel that the requirements are shifting um so one of the things that i've taught myself to do that uh pretty much the uh, i'm very much a routine person so this is the only thing that that's helped me in the past <laughs> and it's helped a couple of my friends is blocking off 15 minutes at the end of the day to retrace your steps through what you've accomplished for the day. It does not matter if you have um, finished everything on your list, just writing down everything that you did do um, so that you can uh, put it against what you were assigned each day and start to see a trend of not only you know what your productivity allowed and what time allowed for, but what were the things that were deprioritized? What were the things that you couldn't get to? Um, and also what things that were on your list did you naturally gravitate towards? Which personally, um, if I'm given a list of things to do, my instinct is to do the things that I like doing first <laughs> because they are fun. Um, now that's not, my advice to anybody, you know, obviously do any, do what you need to do, but the natural instinct is to gravitate towards the things that we are good at. Um, and that is extremely helpful. So after a couple of weeks of tracking and you write out all of the things that you have been assigned for the past couple of weeks in terms of tasks, then you can compare it to 
there's two versions to this. You can compare it to your actual job description that you currently have and use the compare contrast to either bring that into renegotiation for your position with management, um, or you can compare it against your ideal job description of what you want to move into so that you can start to notice those transferable skills. Uh, there was someone that I was talking to uh, yesterday. She was saying that she was in sales and customer service and she's moving into an account executive role with a tech company. And she was worried that she didn't have any transferable skills. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> like, it's all right there. <laughs> like you have, you know, working with customers, you have I, identifying requirements, you have time management skills, you have uh, communication skills, you know, all of these things perfectly transfer into your new position. And um, so we're going to keep that in mind for negotiations as well. Finally, setting regular check-in meetings with your mentor or advisor. So that's assuming at this point that you, you know, you've gotten to the point where you have someone to bounce these ideas off of. Um, again, with that external processing to be like, okay, well, here are your goals. Let's see if over the past couple of weeks, you know, have you been able to incrementally move towards that, you know, um, and help restructure your thinking past the day-to-day -day and past the, the weekly kind of overall feel of your productivity. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions so far? I guess I would just add to this, this Hannah again, that um, the tracking my day-to-day -day was one of the pretty much the other tool that I used the most when I was trying to get a job. Um, I think the journal that I used was called a self journal, but you know, you could use a bullet journal or just like a daily calendar, anything like that. I felt like the more that I used it, the more helpful it was to me. I mean, that's maybe an obvious thing to say, but knowledge is power. And if you have goals that you're trying to reach, writing down as much information about what you're doing to get there and keeping track of what you're doing is going to be really crucial to making progress. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm in favor of uh, tracking, uh, definitely. So yeah, I agree. So yeah, it's sometimes it's difficult because it, what we do, um, even though we shouldn't see it this way is like, you know, our self-worth being tied to our work. Sometimes it can be difficult to even get to the point where we're comfortable writing down what we actually did because sometimes, you know, we do have stuff that falls off the list and has to get pushed to tomorrow. And you have to, you know, look at the list and look at the reality of that. But the more that you do it, the more that you're exposed to it, it, it becomes numbers, it becomes, like, okay, the meeting with this person went for an hour and a half, I hope not. And so I wasn't able to do X, Y, Z, or um, I was able to invest more time into, you know, researching for software testing or researching for this. And I was able to come up with this, it, stuff like that. But yeah, exposing yourself to tracking you know, as much as you can, even if it's not perfect in the first couple of weeks, um, I cannot stress enough, it will get easier, um, even if the first couple of tries aren't ideal. Okay, applying and interviewing. So, um, as far as issues, we have not hearing back from companies after submitting resumes and cover letters. We have not applying to select jobs because you don't know 90% of the resume. And we have not applying to jobs because it's listed as mid-level or senior level job. I love this discussion because all of that, ugh, <laughs> that makes me cringe a little bit, but only because I made all of these mistakes. Um, so not hearing back from companies after submitting resumes and cover letters, that is assuming 
that you're using all of the main job boards. So um, using LinkedIn, using Glassdoor, using, cause you can obviously apply to places there. Um, indeed, any of the job search major engines. Um, the life-changing information that was shared with me whenever I was maybe three, two or three months into my job search was knowing that the resumes, oh gosh, <laughs> the resumes are sent through, you know, whenever they request you to upload your PDF and they're sent through a database to make sure that your uh, like that the right keywords match their ideal list of keywords and sometimes there's even additional um, filters based into that uh, built into that company system to where it'll only pass that resume through if it reaches a certain percentile of accepted keywords which if you're thinking whoa that's not fair you're totally right <laughs> so um, especially sending, you know, resume after resume after resume um, using job boards. It sounds like a huge waste of time. Um, I wouldn't say it's like the worst waste of time, but it's definitely, unless you already have a referral backing it, your chances for getting an interview based off of a job board entry are pretty minimal, which is unfortunate. Um, so focusing on social applications versus job board applications is going to be the ideal. And that means relying on meetup groups. That means making contacts via LinkedIn, as I, I was kind of referring to earlier, where, you know, you keep it casual, you find the company that you know you want to work at. Um, just try to learn more about the company at first. Don't immediately ping them with your resume and cover letter attached. They will not answer you. I have tried. Just kidding. But um, and yeah, just working off of referrals. So again, networking and being present in these groups. Um, I personally have benefited from this particular situation. So um, one of the members of Women Who Code DFW, uh, my goodness, I'm blanking on her name right now. I am so blank on her name right now. One of the members of <laughs> Women Who Code DFW was able to um, provide me with a referral to gain access to an interview for my current position that I have now. And without that, probably wouldn't be where I am right now. Um, so the 60% rule is we're going into not applying to, to select jobs because you don't know 90% of the job description, 60%. You only need to know 60% of the job description. So this is, this makes such a huge difference. So not only is it like understanding 60% of that, but understanding what your skills are and how those transferable skills relate to that position. That's why we were looking at them back before. Um, and also looking back at the uh, Udemy courses, self-guided learning stuff. So that evidence, if there is a crucial knowledge gap in that 40% that you're missing for the time being, you can always show the evidence that you were doing self-guided learning, or you know, you went through a boot camp or something like that at the interview, and say, okay, maybe I don't know Docker, maybe I don't know Jenkins or Ansible or any of those other sophisticated platforms, but I've shown that I have the self-discipline to go through these courses and learn what I needed to learn. And not applying to jobs because it is mid-level or senior level job. Most job descriptions are written by recruiting, which means they don't always get the right requirements from the management teams that are requesting a position be filled. And a lot of you probably already know if you've already, you know, if you've worked in any type of corporate position for a while, not all managers are fully plugged in. So they might not even be fully aware of the requirements that actually need to be filled. So, Keep that in mind, apply anyway, 
make that money, please. Uh, does anyone have any questions so far? Or wins or success stories, all is welcome here. I love reaching out to someone that works at the company. Um, either I like to before applying just to get an idea of what their day-to-day -day is like and then have that conversation go with my name and a stack of resumes. Definitely. And LinkedIn makes it so easy to do that. I think that 60% uh, rule is very helpful because I'll read job descriptions and get so discouraged. I'm like, I don't know everything. <laughs> so the 60% does make me feel better. Definitely. Um, so statistically speaking, uh, this is based off of uh, pretty much, a, I went to a convention a couple of years back virtually for um, HR representatives and recruiting managers. And they said, statistically, uh, people who identified as male were more likely to apply to positions where they uh, only knew 60% or less of the job description. Whereas statistically speaking, people who identified as female apply to positions where they know 80 to 90% of the job description. And dang, <laughs> if I had known that, I've, the amount of opportunities lost and the potential for the best possible fit, that's, that's insane to me. Yeah, we have to stop self-excluding. <laughs> exactly. Um, I have a question on, uh, on applying. Yeah. So, um, so, I mean, there are uh, multiple positions and, you know, job descriptions still vary. So is it still, I mean, and I, uh, it's been a while that I've gotten into job switching. So I, I'm just not maybe so aware. And this is something which I want to do. But uh, do you recommend modifying resumes, you know, for every job that you apply based on the job description? And uh, uh, an add-on question to that is, is cover letter still a thing? Like people, do people still submit cover letters? And is it, I mean, is it actually considered? That is an excellent question. So um, I do not personally um, recommend making a resume for every single job description because that's extremely tedious. Um, but I would say, um, let me remedy that. I don't recommend making one for every single job that you are applying to. I would say that make sure that you have one specifically for the, the type of role that you want. So make sure that your transferable skills are on there and make sure that they apply in this sense. Make sure that you have a good understanding, you know, as, as good as you can uh, before applying to, to know that your resume that you're submitting is a valid reflection of what you know and of your efforts. Um, as far as cover letters, almost nobody reads them, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Unless it is an extremely small company, like I'm saying maybe 20 to 50 employees, um, their HR department is probably not going to read it, um, which Again, if you're mainly applying to positions doing the job board methodology, some uh, will not let you move forward unless you submit a cover letter. So it might be worth it to, if you really want to go for this company, say you're applying to like your dream company, um, try to use the job board for research purposes to try and figure out as much of a profile of the company and that position and then try and find other means of getting a referral <laughs> um, you know, to apply to it. Gotcha. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited for you. Add. I have a little tidbit to add. Sure. Um, <clears throat> one good way to think of a resume is that the point of a resume is to get you an interview. And then the point of an interview is to sell yourself. So even if you don't 
qualify for all of the, the things listed in a job posting, if you can get into an interview and sell yourself, they may be a lot more lenient on the specifics of what you know or don't know, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and sometimes they might have a different position that you might be a better fit for or something like that. So don't worry about what's on the job posting, worry about whether or not you want that job. Right. Definitely. And so I have conducted, um, I'd say a large, maybe two handfuls of interviews for TradeStation for SDEP positions, as well as uh, SRE positions at this point. Um, One of the things that if we're not 100% committed to a candidate because we're unsure of their capabilities, um, odds are the thing in, I'd say in most situations, the thing that puts them over the top is the culture fit, is knowing that they are going to work well within a team, knowing that they're, you know, self-motivated, knowing that they, you know, have all of these other aptitudes that can't necessarily be translated well on a resume or a cover letter. I mean, you could try for sure, (laughs) but um, so yeah, keeping that in mind and Pete does make a good point, you know, as far as it's concerned. Awesome. I'm excited for you. Please keep me posted. Thank you. All right. Anyone have any else, anything else they'd like to share? Cool. Okay, negotiations. So obviously the main issues, you are underpaid and this could be a couple of different scenarios you know there could be that you're in a position you're unhappy with you know your current compensation package so you're looking to go somewhere else to remedy that this could be you want to stay with your company you just want to get paid more um and uh or maybe the company doesn't provide the benefits that you need say you know you're starting a family or you have a family and you know that you need health insurance but your current company does not offer health insurance. Um, But yeah, so one of the things I would say in the scenario where you are trying to get paid market value or fairly for your current position that you're working in is no matter what, come to the meeting with HR, maybe it's your annual review, Um, armed with facts about the average pay for the position. So, and go back to that tracking, go back to all of those notes that you diligently took over time to show what you're currently working on and compare them against the roles, the responsibilities of the role in the market. And basically say, okay, well, I need a 10K bump because I've been underpaid for the past two years. And that might take a while in terms of negotiations, but odds are they are not going to want to lose the staff. So is in the situation where you are going somewhere else to get that pay bump, pretty much the same thing in terms of armed, being armed with facts whenever you arrive, uh, list out Yeah, list out whatever your responsibilities were at your previous position. Maybe it's an identical position. And this is a big thing. So if they ask you what you were making at your previous position, they can't technically do that. That's not something that they can do. So what you're going to want to say in response to that is, like, I'm leaving that company to receive fair market value. I am not currently receiving fair market value for my time and for my services. Or my past position does not accurately reflect the compensation that I should be making for these responsibilities. So keep that in mind. Um, As far as the situation where, you know, your company doesn't provide the benefits that you require Make sure that you are, whenever you're creating a profile for your ideal job description, be extremely incremental with what you want your benefits package to look like. Because most times, um, even if you 
you know, get up there in terms of, um, you know, moving to a really, really big company, like one of the unicorn companies, they're going to give you the benefits packages and just say, okay, pick one, or they're not going to go fully in depth um, with an explanation of benefits. But that is something that you can use in your negotiations against your base pay. So if, say, on their website before you applied, it said, okay, well, we have um, HMO and PPO plans with X provider, we have stock options, we have um, annual bonuses. But whenever you go to the interview, that isn't available, or maybe some of those options aren't available, say stock options aren't available until you're fully vested with the company, which is five years. But that information wasn't available from the start. So you can say, okay, well, in lieu of that benefit, with that benefit being absent, I'd like to revisit the number of my base compensation because I came into this application, I came into this interview assuming that I was going to have that benefit present. And having that number in your mind of what you want it to ideally be with that benefit absent. So say, you know, you're applying for a software engineer role and you are expecting to have 100K base pay plus 10% uh, annual bonuses, plus stock options, plus this. Okay, so take stock options away. Okay, my new number is 110. And just, or even go 115 so that you have some room to negotiate down. Because odds are, they're always going to want to pick a lower number. <laughs> they're never going to say like, okay, yeah, that's fine. Or if they do, keep negotiating up. <laughs> um, and then when it comes to questioning, so this is more on the interview side of things, but um, one of the things that they may do whenever they say, oh, well, we weren't thinking, you know, 110, we were thinking more 105 because of your, um, because of the time spent in that software engineer role that you had in your last job. Um, and that's where you restate the reasons for your parting from the company. But, and you can reiterate your achievements and accolades. Um, well, this is my number. I'm not moving from it. Sorry. Or not even sorry. I'm not moving from it and remain silent because that social pressure, that tension is going to make them uncomfortable <laughs> and it will make them want to revisit uh, with their higher up, essentially, or whoever they talk to to confirm if they can offer something better. Does anyone have any questions? This is my favorite one. I do. So um, I've been reading some of the comments about, um, I think, let's see, someone mentioned about um, what makes a senior developer um, on the roles that it takes and then Earlier, you were mentioning um, when you're tracking your accountability of what position you might want or if the position's not good for you anymore and finding a role that you'd want to transition into. Um, while being a, someone that's technically considered a junior, I am enjoying my, my position. I don't, and I, I don't think that one year will qualify me for any like further roles that I'm doing right now. However, I do believe that there is a market value for each year that you are in the tech industry. And I don't know if, you know, I'm sure like every day, anyone who is doing anything um, in tech is learning something new every day. At least that's kind of the impression that I've, that I've held. So when you, are kind of working on the same thing. And it's not that I'm not looking for new responsibilities because like I said, I'm I'm not sure that there are at the time because we have a very small team, mm -hmm. but does, does length at the company merit compensation increases or adjustments rather? 
Um, and I know that there are some things that they told me in the very beginning that I, I need to address again, which is completely separate. And that has to deal with like bonuses and whatnot because um, mm -hmm. market has changed. But um, what about just, what's your opinion on just time in the current position that you have and if that merits anything? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's fair. So I think it's definitely a case by case basis, I think, because there's the individual that is definitely learning something new every day. There's, you know, the person that naturally pushes themselves, you know, works well with collaborating with the team is working, you know, proactively, you know, to continuously improve. Um, and then there's people that just don't. And, you know, whether they're there for a paycheck, which is, again, totally valid, but they aren't necessarily focused on career growth or movement. Um, you know, compare that individual to the person that, you know, is working actively to improve themselves and improve the team, improve the product. Um, I think there's something to be said uh, in terms of evaluation of differences there. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would say like, it depends on the person, <laughs> but and maybe that's something that like someone who is in a, in a management position or someone who does have people under them might be able to share their experience working with someone who's more junior and like seeing that um, um, if it's, if it is even, um, uh, what is the word? If you can even see the progress that your staff is making because um, I think that's, you know, cause I, I'm not, maybe I, maybe I think something that I have learned is trivial, whereas that's something that is really important for someone to learn and makes my pro and I'm speaking as if I am the senior person makes the process of the senior developer or of the team easier because now you have mastered or just are aware of this new skill and it's, mm -hmm one less thing that I'm now responsible for. And I guess, I guess they see that more than you maybe. Um, I don't know, has anyone experienced that being a manager over um, more junior staff? Not a manager, but um, I didn't quite catch who, who was just asking that question, but um, I think it's a really interesting point that you don't necessarily always have to be going for senior. I mean, if you just started out, I mean, it's totally fine to just, you know, recognize where you are right now. And even maybe you never want to be a senior. Maybe that's just not the kind of work-life balance that you want to have. And that's fine. I think that's something that's not really acknowledged very much that, I think a lot of times women in particular don't necessarily want to um, take on more responsibilities. They don't necessarily want work to be their whole life. And I think that's an okay thing. Um, it's about, you know, priorities and, and what's important to you. So I would say, don't feel like you have to go for a senior or put or a rush, rush to become a senior if that's not something that's, um, you know, gonna be meaningful for you or if it's gonna make your life worse, you know? So that's all. Oh, no, thanks, Hannah. I, I, I totally see that point. I think my um, question was more so about, um, I, I have no intentions of, of, <laughs> of being a senior overnight. I think it's more of just, um, um, I guess it's my 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 main question was about um was it about pay in terms yeah. of like the longevity yeah longevity of of like your time at the company and and pay um because I'm come I'll be coming into a year here in a few months mm -hmm. and that's a conversation that I need to ask to see like you know how do I really know if I've improved um because it's very new to me Yes. Um, so that's kind of, that was just my, my main concern, but I, I do appreciate your input, Hannah. Um, 
because sometimes I think I don't ever really want to be over multiple people. I, I very much enjoy doing my my own tasks and and then calling it a day. Um, but I don't know if that will change in the future. Yeah, I mean, you can always like move up technically um, in being an independent contributor. So don't think that moving up is exclusive to being a manager. Um, that's something that I'm discovering along my own personal journey. Um, but so one, most companies should give you annual raises, even if it's like somewhere in the two to 5% range, check with your company's policy on that, ask people what they're getting paid. <laughs> um, ask your coworkers, especially your female coworkers, um, to get an idea of what they are paying for people who have similar job descriptions. Um, and, you know, reach out to people who are more senior than you. And, you know, once you harbor, you know, trust and, you know, get that conversation going, then once you get to a point of comfortability, you can ask, um, you know, what is the annual uh, salary bump situation? Um, and then it also comes to uh, are your responsibilities changing? It, you know, did was there a new project that was introduced that forced you to learn some type of skill, some type of tech stack, some type of process? Um, because that is money. <laughs> like that, that is something that you are adding to your repertoire for pretty much the rest of your career. Um, and that doesn't mean having them pay necessarily for the course, which they should anyway, if you're doing it for work, but investing in the employee that you're becoming, that's a super valuable conversation to have. And I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, I think I am at the end here and thank you everybody so much for everything and all of your your anecdotes and questions, like they really were amazing. Um, these links and resources will be available on the uh, Women Who Code DFW Slack channel if you want to learn more. Um, I'm also available either on LinkedIn or Slack if you would like to reach out to me. My social links are in the description for the event if you would like to learn more. Uh, but I'm going to open up to a kind of more well-rounded <laughs> Q&A. So if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to ask. Um, Megan, regarding the uh, negotiations, especially when you're shifting companies, that those, uh, does those talks only happen with the recruiter or it can it also be with the manager? Typically speaking, it's going to be with the recruiter because they're the ones that are given the permission to talk about money. <laughs> right. Um, and given the permission to talk about benefits packages and stuff like that. Uh, there is the one-off situation where you know, there is you know, the manager talking to you about it, but that's in very small companies. And I, I'd say more in like the nonprofit industry. Um, the reason that I asked was because it happened with me uh, a couple of years ago that I was talking with the recruiter, but. I mean, when that negotiation started, somehow the next call that I received was directly from the manager. So I just felt a little out of place and awkward uh, mm -hmm. as to how that conversation should go. And is that is that is that an okay conversation or not? Because it's a different. Uh, I just felt it was different when I was conversing with the recruiter versus the manager when it comes to pay. So I it just felt a little awkward. Definitely. I think I'd feel awkward about that too. Um, especially, yeah, whenever it comes to like what you're being paid, that should be handled by HR. Um, and it would, I know that like, you know, hindsight's 2020 and you've already gone through this super uncomfortable situation. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but even saying like, are you the right person that I should be talking to about this? And you know, mm -hmm. is there a better suited person for me to have this conversation with? Um, you know, bringing that up right before you even like give your number of what you're looking to get paid or whatever number that they're advising you. Right. Um, if you can kind of sense that conversation going in that direction, um, what you should be talking about with the manager is the role, the responsibilities, um, the rest of the team, what the day-to-day -day looks like, kind of just 
again, the profile of the position, HR should be handling everything else. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions for wins? Hi, um, I had a question. Um, I am kind of changing careers a little bit. Um, I want to be doing web development and I was doing desktop support before. Um, so it was computers, but it's still totally different. And I guess I'm just kind of confused about how, because it's like, you know, when I look at the job postings and stuff, you know, they want you even for entry level or junior level positions, but definitely entry level, they still want you to know a lot. And I'm just like, what I know, I know about HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and you know, those are kind of what I know. And I'm just like, but gosh, how am I gonna find time to learn about this, this, this? It's like, I'm trying to find a balance and also be looking for a job too. And I'm just like kind of feeling overwhelmed because <laughs> I don't know what plan of attack I should have. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so this is kind of a by and large mentality that I have, and I, I think I've kind of inherited it from the, the networks that I'm a part of, is they don't know what they want. <laughs> um, <laughs> so job descriptions are glorified wish lists, um, and a lot of them are written by recruiting with the help of the manager that you're going to be working with. So you know, say again, we're using my position as an example. So I'm a QA engineer essentially. So you know, they look up on certain websites that give them buzzwords whenever it comes to quality engineer, they have essentially hashtag um, automation, hashtag Python, hashtag PyTest, all of those kind of buzzwords that appear in, in certain searches on people's profiles. Um, and they build these wish lists. And again, this is where the 60% rule comes in, where you know you should kind of segment out the part that you know that you know well and know that you have the skills and the aptitudes for and go for it anyway. Um, and then whenever it comes to the interview, kind of figure out from the manager themselves what's truly important in the role. Um, so take any job descriptions with a grain of salt. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and I know it's super overwhelming, but I I know you're gonna get a position soon, but yeah, well, thank I, you. I'm rooting for you. I appreciate that, thanks. I have a question. Sure. Uh, kind of going along with what Jennifer was saying about not just really finding out what they actually want. Um, I graduated from boot camp in October. I've been consistently reviewing JavaScript, doing all the courses I could on LinkedIn Learning, like trying to really make sure that it's solid. Um, but then I had this nice long list of, I wanna reemphasize my Python skills. I wanna work on my Java skills. Um, when, is there a point that I might go overboard in the sense that like, if I have Python, Java, um, JavaScript, all these different tech tools and languages on my resume for, a, for someone who has less than a year of experience, could I go accidentally go the wrong way in terms of they may not take me serious because I'm it looks like I just sprouted out a dictionary of language tools? Um, I'm going to say yes and no here. Um, I think it's very possible in the pursuit of making yourself marketable that you don't find a focus um, and find what you actually enjoy, um, which whenever you're on the job search, you know, you want everyone saying diversify so that you have, you know, the greatest chance of being hired, but that definitely could hurt you whenever it comes to an interview um, where say, you know, they're, they're focusing on a Python, Python stack and, or they're focusing on a Java stack, you know, exclusively Android and you focused all of your projects, you know, interspersed throughout all of these languages where you could have taken that time and focused it on a particular language or maybe two of those languages. And I remember, I think you attended my last talk too. 
Um, and I remember you are a Jane of all trades. And I, so I, I know what's probably going on in your head for sure. But, and it feels counterintuitive, but maybe finding a focus or finding a particular platform that you want to focus on for a little while, um, meaning like maybe four to six months and investing time into those projects and gearing your search towards companies that use that tech stack in that language, you might have mm -hmm. better, better results with that. Okay. Is there any languages that seem to have kind of like, I, I've been focusing mainly on the MERN stack. That's what my boot camp was in. Um, my data science boot camp was in Python. And so with Python, there's a lot of holes basically because it's not really meant for web development. It was more for data science. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking, really focusing on JavaScript and say Python because Python, I, I get a lot of people asking about the data science. I, I even look at the data science and realize there's a lot of stuff that I wouldn't have learned in that data science boot camp. So I'm not really, I feel like I've limited myself with the Python because I have it. I just haven't dived into it well enough to use it in web development. Mm -hmm. Well, it really, um, going back to the whole like profile, building the profile of your ideal position, that's where you want to focus your tech stack is ultimately what you want to do, which I know takes a lot of kind of soul searching. Um, and that comes with talking to people, going to these, like going to tech conferences that, you know, there are virtual tech conferences at this point. Um, and finding what you vibe with, finding like, oh, wow, I find, you know, machine learning with Python super interesting, or I find, you know, you know, I work with a, a fintech app, uh, I work with stock and trading applications, uh, maybe you find that super interesting, and then just kind of reverse engineer it in your head of the different tech stacks, platforms, programs that you would need to focus on to get there. Mm -hmm. um, maybe find a list of three to five things that you fi find interesting, <laughs> knowing you, <laughs> as opposed I, to- I'm, I'm horrible with decisions. My boyfriend says I have uh, decision anxiety. I, I'm, I, as soon as you ask me to pick between more than two things, I'm, I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's something that you can eventually work towards, not something yeah. that you have to do today. Just start trying it. stuff. Just start trying stuff. Megan it's went made... from Megan went from front end web development to back end web development to maybe JavaScript to maybe Python. Finally settling on testing where she's at now, all yeah. within the space of about two or three months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm the reason Udemy's in business um, because I was oh, just yeah. like buying all of the courses. Maybe I like yeah. this. No, yeah. just, Maybe just like try, just try a bunch of stuff, find courses, find books, find people to talk to about them and just mm -hmm. try doing it and see if you enjoy doing that work. Yeah. You got this, Jessica. <laughs> I hope the next time I see you, like you're just like, yeah, I found this position and I absolutely love it. And I'm working in one language. <laughs> <laughs> but that's boring. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm mostly joking. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, if I think I'm going to ask for maybe one more question, then we're going to get things wrapped up because we're coming at the top of the hour here. Um, does anyone have anything else they'd like to share? Yeah, I have a question. Hello, sure. everyone. So I'm actually new to tech. I have my background in medicine and uh, recently I just find myself becoming very attractive to tech. But uh, one very funny thing I see is I try to like focus on one thing, but I, I am getting overwhelmed by not knowing where exactly to start from for somebody that is entirely new. So how do I know which of the uh, programming or, do, or is it AI, is it machine learning, is it software engineer? What am I supposed to start from? So that's like one of the big, trouble I've been having and I, I just like okay let me come to this conference and see maybe I'll get an idea of what it is but it's like you guys are so advanced and I'm trying to <laughs> pick out what everybody's saying so for somebody that is totally new what do you advise them to start from what should they do first 
Oh man. Um, well, I think there's maybe a, a misunderstanding that everyone who works in tech are geniuses. We're not. We just found something that we liked just like everybody else. And we found whatever was needed to do our job. <laughs> just like, you know, when you worked in medicine, um, what did what did you do when you worked in medicine? Okay, so I actually, uh, what do I do? I see, I see patients, mostly medical patients and then just uh, prescribe them their medications and other labs and basically treat them, so. Yeah, but like, to me, that sounds extremely impressive. And that makes me think that you're a genius because you had to go through all of the schooling to, you know, have the ability to treat patients and, you know, you got to that point with going to school and getting exposed and maybe ideally, you know, finding out that you wanted to treat patients. So uh, kind of what I just meant, mentioned to Jessica, when it comes to finding something that you're interested in um, and what Pete just mentioned as well, just start trying stuff. The, the only way to know is by doing, unfortunately, um, but if you are the type to have decision fatigue, like myself and like Jessica and pretty much the worldwide everybody, um, I'd, stay, I'd say start with small manageable goals and you know finding someone that you can bounce those ideas off of. Um, like a few of these other lovely people have mentioned. Um, so maybe just say, okay, I will start just like a lot of people started with a front end tech stack. So HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, I'll take a Udemy course and tell my, my friend or, or my mentor, you know, who, what I was able to do that week so that you can slowly start to see some progress. Um, I'm actually, so this personal tracking link that I have up here, this is gonna probably be really helpful for you um, so that you can weekly kind of check in with your findings. And maybe you get like a couple of days into front end stuff. You're like, nope, I don't like it. I wanna try something else. That is okay. That does not mean that your efforts are wasted. It just means you're finding another path. And that's okay. This is probably the best time to do that um, is figuring out what you want to do. Just like whenever you're figuring out what college to go to or yeah, it's, it's a brand new opportunity and it's super exciting. I know it can feel a little overwhelming at first, but hopefully that helped. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope everyone enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much for everyone for contributing because that definitely breathed a lot of life into it. Um, I had a wonderful evening. I hope, yeah, I hope everyone had fun. I'm gonna pass it back to Melissa.